Good evening, everyone, and a very warm welcome to tonight's webinar on COVID-19 and the Faculty of Medicine and Health. My name is Marie Christopher Davey and I'm the fundraising manager in the alumni and development team here at the University of Leeds. Now, some of you may be aware of how the university as a whole has responded to the coronavirus pandemic. However, this evening's webinar will focus specifically on the work of the Faculty of Medicine and Health and the extraordinary efforts of their staff and students. Whilst we won't be able to cover everything that the faculty has done in response to the pandemic, we hope that you leave tonight with a new understanding and appreciation of this fantastic faculty. Without further ado, I'd like to introduce our first guest of the evening, Professor Paul Stewart, who is our Executive Dean of the Faculty of Medicine and Health. His clinical expertise includes the management of pituitary and adrenal disorders, endocrine and hypertension and reproductive medicine. Along with his responsibility to the university, Professor Stewart is also an honorary consultant endocrinologist at the Leeds Teaching NHS Trust and a member of the executive board of the Leeds Academic Health Partnership, where he leads the Centre for Personalised Medicine and Health. Thanks for joining us, Paul. Nice to see you this evening. Thank you, Marie, and it's a, a really pleasure to be here. And, and may I extend my thanks to everybody that's joined this webinar from, I know, all corners of the globe. Thank you very much. Thanks. Thank you. Now, the Faculty of Medicine Health is one of the largest at the university with more than 5,000 students. And of course, a lot of those degree courses within the faculty, like medicine and dentistry and nursing, involve clinical placement activity. So the last year must have seen quite a few changes for you all in student education. Can you tell us how the faculty has responded to COVID and the new ways in which it's, it's evolved teaching? Yeah, it's, it's such, a, such a topical question. I mean, you know, first and foremost, it's worthwhile rehearsing that the you know, the overarching mission of our faculty, first and foremost, is to capacity build tomorrow's NHS. Um, and just some sense of the scale and complexity of what we do. We have a total of 107 programmes and there are fewer than 650 modules. So, so really very quickly, we had to move those almost totally to a digital, digital landscape. But as you say, the, the bit that was really critical here was preserving clinical placements. And obviously that was challenging in making sure we met, we met you know, government guidelines. Um, but I think we've done a great job. And, and because we were so well placed on where we were on our journey in some of the digital technology um, enhancement of our, endocrine, of our endocrine, of our educational offer, um, we were in good shape to take that to the next stage. So a couple of examples of innovation, you know, in healthcare, for example, um, while some of the direct clinical placements were challenging, we very rapidly moved to a series of interactive simulation video sessions where we were helping our students in the setting of either a, a home care in the case of a community nurse, uh, for a social worker in, in social setting, you know, going through very simple questions like, um, um, you, you know, how to, how to handle the disruptive dog, uh, you know, when faced with patients, how to ask people politely to, to turn televisions off, as well as exploring the, the personal skills. And in primary care, we move lock, stock and barrel largely in, in partnership with Imperial College and others. Um, instead of the on-site primary care clinical placement, which of course wasn't possible, moving to a whole series of interactive videos um, with student and professional in the same room, but also video cameras in the waiting room, uh, listening to what, what patients were saying about the, the future and past communications and, and, uh, and, and, um, and professional experience. So, so we've, we've adapted very quickly, I think, to, uh, to make sure that those clinical placements were, were, were preserved. No mean feat at all. And, and can you tell us a bit more about the student doctors and nurses joining the NHS front line between March and June last yeah, year? Yeah, well, here I've been, you know, full of praise for um, everybody that's that, that, that stood up. I mean, re remember that we, on average, have about a thousand undergraduates every year that enter the NHS works, work, workplace. And um, what happened in 2020 is virtually all of those entered it in between March, April and, and um, at the latest May, instead of that um, 
you know, dreaded August the first deadline, which will be familiar as it is to me, to many, to many people on the on the call. So that was a huge effort moving that whole dial forward three, four months, all with approval from our regulators, GMC, GDC, NMC, and, and what have you. Um, so of course now the efforts really turned to what was the fourth year students last year, because we know a few of those we'll hear from later. You know, their challenge was 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 demanding in terms of some of the lost learning they had, and they're now facing the, the challenges of the fifth year going forward. Um, but in doing that, we also, um, um, you know, very rapidly turned some of our services into, into clinical skills, clinical simulators, so we could upskill existing NHS uh, workforce, for example, going into intensive care units. Um, you know, we were able to provide a, a portfolio of postgraduate taught as well as uh, moving the undergraduate um, um, students through. So a huge effort for which I'm very proud of everybody's contribution. And so you should be an, an incredible effort but by everybody. And, and I understand even the faculty staff were deployed over the last years to support the, the, the response to the coronavirus pandemic, many returning to frontline uh, clinical duties. Yeah, we have, um, you know, the workforce is about 12, 1300 of which uh, over 100 of those are, are, are broadly speaking what we call clinical academics. And these could be the nursing, allied health professionals, dentists, the majority of them doctors who have 50-50 contracts with our NHS partners. So they do their academic work. They're, they're like me, I'm, I'm a consultant endocrinologist as well as, as, well as doing my, my, my university activity. And we were able you know, to quite quickly switch off or pause their university activity, obviously not, not in any way detracting from the educational um, um, aspirations uh, to allow those individuals to go back to frontline activity. And, and, you know, over 85% of them did so. Uh, importantly, it wasn't just them though. You know, we've also got a, a huge number, almost 70 um, trainees and nationally 1900 um, uh, clinical academics in training, you know, registrar, senior house officer um, uh, level uh, were deployed uh, direct frontline in order to meet the COVID pandemic. So a quite dramatic turnaround really, and I was able to, to, to do that um, you know, very quickly. The other thing I'll just say there very quickly, Marie, is it, it didn't stop there for activity uh, in terms of direct patient care. The, the, the response we've had from both our own workforce, but particularly the students to stand up and volunteer for you know, setting up lateral flow testing facilities across the campus, helping the lighthouse facilities with PCR testing, and now, actually, as those of you who may or may not have had your vaccine and vaccinations, you know, they're part of the vaccination workforce across Leeds City region going forward as well. Um, 450 students stood up within 24 hours of asking uh, to staff their the lateral flow testing facility at the university. I mean, their, their resilience is, is just amazing. Incredible. And, and, and I know also we're going to be speaking to, to Dr. Uh, Minaj Savan uh, later on about his research into long COVID re rehabilitation. And I know a lot of, of other researchers across the faculty adapted the focus of their research in response to the COVID-19 yeah. pandemic. Can you give me a few examples of some of those other research projects? Yes, I can. So remember, I started one of the missions of the faculty was, was capacity building the workforce. The other one is actually using our research excellence to improve patient and population health, because we know that drives patient better patient outcomes. And again, the response I think there has been really impressive. And I'll divide that into, into two, two ways. Firstly, how we played a part in the delivery arm of research across the UK, the, the stuff you see every night on the BBC, you know, on your news channels, be it the recovery trial, which led to dexamethasone being, being um, proven to be effective. Leeds as a city was the largest uh, recruiting uh, city across the UK to vaccine studies. So we've played our our, our, our important role there. But where it comes to what I call in-house, um, you know, um, investigator initiated research, we've also risen to the challenge. So at the last count, almost 5 million in new research applications, many coming from the government um, UKRI rapid response COVID trials. And I'll just give you two, two examples. Manoj is gonna talk about his excellent research in a minute, as you say. Um, but, but one particular example that I'll cite 
um, is some really great work that Carl Thompson's doing in, in healthcare, nursing background, but really looking at how best to um, respond to that, you know, dreadful statistic of 30,000 deaths in the care home sector in the first wave, 80% infection rate, and re really using completely different um, test and tracing uh, methodology, in particularly in that sector. The second one is from one of our academics, Mark Wilcox, who actually uh, is very much working uh, aligned with the government as part of the SAGE uh, committee. Uh, Mark's an infection guru, uh, and, and he's really actually worried about the potential fecal transmission of COVID uh, in terms of the virus being excreted um, uh, fecally and, and the potential fecal oral transmission of that. Um, so those have been examples where we've where we've really risen to the challenge, but we haven't just been been focused on the direct effects of COVID. You, you'll be well aware of some of the concerns that we as healthcare professionals have for our patients with cardiovascular disease, mm. for our patients with cancer, who who aren't getting the normal care that they that that they usually do. And again, we've been really publishing in the very best journals, lots of press media on this in terms of the data we've shown, for example, that we may have, have seen 80,000 excess cardiovascular deaths last year, probably 30,000 excess cancer deaths, simply because of a break in those you know, non-COVID related pathways. So it's, it's far reaching, um, but, but, it, but, but you know, it, it's really high quality stuff. And, um, and obviously, you know, as I said, is putting the patient first, it improves patient outcomes. Paul, thank you. Uh, we'll come back to you later on um, and we're going to speak to, to Dr. Savan now. Thank you very much, Paul. Thank you. So now I'd like to introduce uh, Dr. Minaj Savan. Dr. Savan is an Associate Clinical Professor at the University, but also a consultant in rehabilitation medicine at the LGI, Leeds General Infirmary. Dr. Savan has turned his research skills into assessing long-term re rehabilitation of COVID survivors who are suffering from post-viral symptoms, or as we would know it, long COVID. Welcome, Dr. Savan. Thank you so much for joining us this evening. Hello. Hello. Hello there. Hi. Nice to see you. Can you briefly tell us how your research came about, please? Okay. Thank you, uh, Marie, and thank you to, for everyone for joining this webinar. So, as Marie introduced, I'm uh, uh, an associate professor and consultant in rehab medicine. So, I would like to just kind of elaborate on that. So, rehab medicine involves looking after people uh, long term. So, looking after long term conditions and trying to improve outcomes. So, we predominantly deal with people with uh, brain injury, spinal cord injury, musculoskeletal trauma. Uh, and COVID obviously has joined the list now. So we, um, as physicians in this area, we are interested in the long-term impact. So as Paul was saying, when there was this outbreak, um, we as clinical academics, so I'm 50-50 as well, uh, working across university and trust. So we were all redeployed uh, in uh, mid-March uh, to the NHS um, trust to um, to so to work in frontline looking after COVID patients. So when we were actually dealing with the acute crisis and patients actually recovering and when they were getting discharged, we saw a lot of persistent and um, residual symptoms in patients. And obviously that is our area of expertise. And we were just genuinely interested as to how these patients perform long-term. And then we started looking at, um, so we wanted to know, well, this is not the first outbreak we know about. We know about the SARS and the MERS outbreaks. So we did a, a very comprehensive meta-analysis looking at the SARS and MERS outbreaks and the long-term outcomes. And what we found was about one third of patients who survived the illness, even a year later, were having persistent symptoms. So we thought, well, this is a related virus, is the same virus, so the impact should be equivalent or probably should be more because we know this virus is more deadly, the mortality is more. So then we set up uh, a trial where we actually wanted to look at the long-term outcomes of patients getting discharged from the uh, acute trust after recovering from COVID. So when we say recovering, they were fit for discharge, but they were still having symptoms. 
So then we set up uh, what is known as a tele rehab system to remotely assess these patients, get in touch with them about seven weeks after discharge and to assess their needs. And that was the first study of its kind in the country. And that was published in Journal of Medical Virology. It, um, well, um, to our surprise, it's actually been cited uh, about more than 65 times in the last six months. And that itself, you know, is kind of, that'll class as a four star paper uh, in university terms. But we were not interested in that. We were interested in patient care. And it's just, it just shows the impact of the research. It was first in the country to demonstrate that the, there is something called long-term symptoms which patients have. Uh, and then it got rebranded as long COVID and post COVID syndrome. Basically what it means is people recovering from COVID, not everyone makes a complete recovery. About 10% of people actually long-term have persistent symptoms and some to the extent that they actually are so disabled that they cannot function in their daily activities, they cannot go back to work. And you'll be surprised that actually the people who are worst hit are actually the most productive workforce. So frontline workers, and people who've been leading a very kind of active jobs. So these are the people who are actually uh, affected quite significantly. So you could say, well, this is actually another pandemic waiting mm -hmm. uh, to hit the healthcare services and we need to deal with them. And 10% is a lot. So if you work out the math, it is almost about more than 200,000 in UK, um, uh, and which is a significant amount of people who are a fit workforce and we need to get them back um, in, in action. Incredibly worrying. I, I, and I, I believe you and your team have, have been leading the way with this research. As you say, you were the first in the country. And that really does show, doesn't it, just how important the role of clinical research at the university combined with the NHS is. Can you tell us a bit more about that? Yeah, I mean, that's something which is uh, I'm very passionate about, because obviously I am a clinical academic. And I think that's the well, I'm, I'm a bit biased about it, but as a clinical academic, I feel that actually that's the, that's the role which has the greatest impact because we working with patients in NHS, we actually get an idea of, well, what, what is a good research question? Which, which comes to us, I think, first as naturally clinicians, because I mean, the simple example of COVID I gave, we were looking after these patients and we know that, well, this is not right. There's something needs to be done about these patients. So that would come only to a clinician working with patients. And at the same time, I've got all the resources um, uh, you know, uh, at my disposal to carry out that research. So obviously I've got the track record and I've got the relevant people needed for me to do the research. So I can actually bridge that. I can, I can do the research and then again, I can take the research back again to the clinical area. So for example, I'll just tell you how how much of an impact the work has had. So carrying on, then we published this work in Journal of Medical Virology, and obviously the Leeds commissioners who work with us on services, they got interested in this report and they said, well, this is quite a lot because what we found in the study was about 70% of people having persistent symptoms after hospital discharge at at seven weeks. So it's quite a lot. So then the commissioner says we, we had to set up, we have to set up a service to deal with this. So hence that led to the setting up of a COVID rehab um, service in the Leeds Community Healthcare Trust, where, where I also have some sessions. So I work across both the trusts. So we set this up and this is again, the first in the country. So the first in the country, uh, a first COVID rehab um, service, which was set up. Now, then we generated the kind of the pathways and the staff which, is, uh, which, which are needed, who are needed to run the service. And then on back of that, the NHS England guidance came out later, suggesting that for long COVID, we need uh, dedicated centers across the country. We need 40 centers and they spent about 20 million on that and to provide support to these people. So at that point of time, when NHS England guidance was coming out, there was no evidence except for the kind of work we had done. So if you look at the NHS England guidance, the, the kind of tools they, they mention um, to be used and the personnel needed is all actually from our pathway, which was set up in Leeds. So as part of that, we developed a scale called uh, the Yorkshire Rehab Screen. It's called the C19 uh, Yorkshire Rehab Screen Scale. And that has been actually 
uh, recommended by NHS England and subsequently there was nice guidelines which also recommended its use. So that's the kind of the impact I think my role has had to be able to lead the team and I don't think I would have been able to have such an impact if I was not in that particular kind of clinical academic role. That's really fantastic stuff and, and particularly for for, for you and your team, but also for the university and the region to, to be to be leading it like that. You must be incredibly proud of that. Yes, definitely. I think I think that's what well, we, we all are in this profession to actually improve patient care and to have an impact on services. So that's the bottom line of whatever we do and all the kind of, you know, the, the medical education we have and, you know, the, the difficult choices we make, the sacrifices we make is ultimately to improve patient care. And I think We've clearly achieved that. Uh, well, there's a lot more to be done. Obviously, this is only a start. We've got a, we've set up a service. The patients are all coming in, and we are doing a best for them. But what we want to do really is to take this forward and make sure that we have the best possible care for these patients with long COVID, and make sure, you know, they have the least impact going forward. Because this wasn't done pre in previous outbreaks of SARS and MERS. We want to make a difference with COVID to demonstrate that if we actually set up appropriate services and provide the appropriate care, we could actually reduce the burden. I mean, it's all about reducing burden because I said 10% is quite a lot and you know, mm -hmm. 200,000 people, we've got to actually work really hard to make sure that you know, we get most of them back into their previous roles. And they're all, as I said, you know, quite fit and you know, functioning very high in their roles prior to contracting COVID. And so what does the future hold then? You talk about, you know, the need to carry on doing this. How do you carry on your research, carry on the impact that you're having to, to particularly with the second wave that we've had and, and everything that's been happening more recently? Yeah, so I mean, the second wave, I think, is going to add to the burden of um, long COVID. And um, we don't know that there's quite a lot which we don't know about long COVID, the underlying, you know, uh, the pathophysiology, what's going on with the immune system. And, you know, is there any way we can intervene early or late, either with drugs or with other kind of rehab interventions, which will reduce the impact. So we've done all the basics now. So we've got, we, 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 we have raised awareness about long COVID. And as Paul was mentioning, very high impact publications and BMJ, we've, we've written in BMJ about it. And, and so we've done all that. So we've done all the groundwork, we've set up a service, we've got all the appropriate professionals lined up, uh, multidisciplinary, I mean, it's just not rehab, we've got respiratory, cardiology, all working together. So we've got the professionals, we've, we've, we've raised all the, the awareness and we've got all the patients in the pathway. What needs to be done is the appropriate evidence-based interventions, which can reduce the impact. And and uh, I must say here that actually the whole country is looking up at Leeds because we are so ahead of everyone else. I mean, the rest of the country is just setting up the services and we are uh, looking at interventions now. So I think we need, there's a lot of work to be done to produce evidence base for these interventions and then make sure that these interventions are actually disseminated to other centers. And part of that is running multi-center trials. So we uh, are um, uh, collaborating with Imperial, with Oxford, um, and, and, and other universities. And the next phase will be these multi-center um, trials of interventions. When I say interventions, it's just not medical interventions, it's rehab interventions as well. But it's all around long COVID. So that's what obviously our focus mm -hmm. is. We're not looking at acute COVID care because I'm sure there are other people working in that area. And you, I know that you are talking about also this scale becoming an app that, that people can- oh, yes. That people can use. Can you tell me a bit, bit more about that? Sure. So since NHS England and, and Nice have actually recommended the tool, and because of uh, you know all the kind of international recognition and multiple, actually it got translated in. Uh, I'm aware of at least five languages it got translated in, and you know we get numerous requests from studies um, abroad wanting to use the scale. So we thought, well, we, we definitely need to make it much more easy and much more accessible because of the scale of the problem. So we've um, collaborated with a company called Ilaros, who's, um, um, who are actually developing a digital system. So what's going to happen is this scale will become an, an app which the patient can access and will fill it up. It will 
generate a score. So at the moment, there is no score for long COVID. So everyone is long COVID. We don't know who are mild, who are moderate, who are severe. So this scale now has been modified so that it generates a, a score and the patient will self-report on an app. The clinician will have a web portal which will be linked. So the clinician can see that this is my patient. He's come in with this score. This is the intervention we provide and what happens to that score after intervention. Because at this point of time, even if you provide an intervention, there's no way of knowing how much change you are producing. Mm -hmm. so, so this app will do that. And we're also doing some psychometric analysis and there's support from University of Leeds internal grant funding, uh, Medical Research Council, to look at the psychometric analysis of this scale and and again as i said you know the country is kind of waiting for us to actually validate it and come up with those metrics and this app so that it all can be used and we can centralize the data to university of leeds and do some further analysis on the scale and i understand you know you talk about there being a certain percentage of people who will have long covid and and the fact that these are quite high performing you know working hard working people that and I suppose that the impact of that is what if you don't tackle long COVID, what will happen to the, to these people? What's the, you well, know, if you don't intervene quickly? Yeah, I mean, I think it's hard to imagine. I mean, all these people, as I said, you know, frontline workers and many of them haven't returned. I think the last time we looked at it uh, about uh, in our case, about 40 percent hadn't returned to their previous roles. So this will have a serious impact on not only, you know, their lives because they're not returning to job, but it's about the country's economy because this is a productive workforce. And if they don't come back. So if you just imagine even the NHS, the frontline mm -hmm. workers, if they don't, they don't get back to their roles, how are we going to actually, you know, manage, uh, uh, you know, the NHS workload? Uh, it's just to give an example. So this applies to uh, every other profession. So I think it's huge because obviously we are too busy now with acute uh, COVID and reducing deaths. Uh, it is obviously that will take priority. But I mean, it's just to warn everyone that this is going to be a big healthcare issue in the next, you know, four or five years to come because it is not going to be easy to get these people fully recovered and back into their roles and i can say dealing with these people that these patients that actually it's not that easy there's no quick fix uh, to long COVID. yes there are mild patients who actually do better with therapy and return back but the ones which are moderate and severe actually it is it is a long process and, and you have, for example, chronic fatigue syndrome. Now, not everyone will get chronic fatigue, but there is a proportion of people who get chronic fatigue after viral illness that has been shown with the previous SARS and MERS outbreaks. And I mean, they, these people never return to their previous roles and previous jobs. So I think, you know, it's, it's, it's going to be a huge responsibility to try to reduce that burden and make sure that not, you know, uh, everyone ends up with chronic fatigue syndrome, not that they will, but even, you know, if there is a significant chunk of that sort of 10%, it's quite a lot mm. if you think about the numbers, yeah. Mm, absolutely. Dr. Savan, I could listen to you talk all night. It's really fascinating stuff. Thank you so much for, for giving us a glimpse into your research and, 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 you know, for you and your team, for all of the work that you're doing, it's absolutely fantastic. So thank you so much. Thank you. Now, along with the efforts of staff and researchers across the faculty, we're also incredibly proud of the resilience and adaptability shown by our students. This webinar wouldn't be complete without hearing their side of the story. So please allow me to introduce final year medical students, Chantelle Waddington and Patrick Ashby. Hi, Patrick. Hi, Chantelle. Thank you for joining us tonight. Hi, thanks for having us. You're welcome. Patrick, first of all, if I can come to you, how has life changed as a medical student since the pandemic hit? It must be a different world now. Yeah, I can't quite remember what came before all this. <laughs> I remember it being a lot more free. I think, obviously, for all students, for everyone, life's changed completely. Um, but specifically as a medical student, it's just been a weird year. It's been weird knowing that very soon we're going to be on the front lines working to try and help with the COVID efforts. Um, but also the changes to our placements and to our curriculum have been, have been enormous over the last year. And how has teaching changed for you? Has it had to become a lot more on the job, if you know what I mean? Um, I'd say so. We used to have teaching in lecture theatres with the whole year group, which seems 
absolutely insane now. 300 people crammed inside one room with no masks, um, crammed in like sardines. Mm. Um, so now we do have a lot more online teaching. Um, there is some larger group teaching, but a lot of the teaching is just in our small placement groups. Um, and that's all online mainly. We have a, a couple of in-person stuff and the university has adapted very well and the hospitals have adapted very well to making sure that we are protected um, for the more clinical skills learning side. Um, but yeah, it's completely different to how it used to be. Yes, I can imagine. And Chantelle, I mean, as a medical student, when you signed up for your course years ago, I can never imagine that you would have been learning in the midst of a global pandemic. I mean, goodness, what a training ground. It must be quite a scary situation for you all, though, surely. Yeah, it's honestly, you just couldn't make this stuff up, could you? <laughs> um, we couldn't have predicted we'd be here. Um, but I think it's, it's been a bit of a mixed um, sort of bag with emotions. I think when things started, we were, I felt very lucky. I felt very grateful um, to be near, but not quite there. Cause I got to be home, be safe. And I was sort of thinking about my colleagues and, and thinking they must be, you know, going through so much and that must be really difficult. But there was also a big part of me that, what, that thought, you know, graduating and qualifying is within arm's reach. And it was so close to helping and being able to be a part of that it was almost a little bit frustrating being sent home because you wanted to contribute after especially after seeing our colleagues struggle um so it was a bit of a mixed bag with it but mm. yeah it was certainly safer at home <laughs> yes totally and I know you did eventually get on to the wards and and be able to feel useful as you put it yes. tell me about the sorts of things you were doing so when placement first started it was um it's a little bit of just finding what we could do to be most helpful and least in the way and in the safest way possible and the teams were wonderfully supportive um obviously a lot of our teachers are doctors and our support is normally from them more than anything and things sort of got flipped and it was we meet people for four weeks and they become our supervisor and they have been fantastic they've been so hands-on reaching out to us checking we're okay saying you know you don't have to come into this hot ward if you don't want let, let's try and find you an alternative if, if you're at higher risk or if, if you're not comfortable yet and we were eased into things um, and we sort of learned how to be a lot more independent a lot more confident in our abilities because they trusted us um, they gave us the opportunity and we learned a little bit more on the job so now when I go on a ward round I think I'm part of the team and that's that's a wonderful feeling and this year it sort of cemented that we are actually really close to being part of that team and now when I come home, I think, oh, I think I helped do that today. <laughs> that's that's just <laughs> been really nice. It was a little bit tricky at first, lots changed. Um, mm -hmm. Sometimes you go in one week and this clinic's running or this this person is the person you're meant to be shadowing and, and things get changed probably a lot more frequently than they did pre on previous placements before COVID. So it's been a, been a bit of a challenge on just thinking on your feet, finding mm -hmm. opportunities. And I, I, I really have been really pleasantly surprised with how many people have just been like yeah follow me let's 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 find you something to do we can make use of you um let's get you stuck in so that's been really good yeah if i that's could just great. add to that quickly um sure. incredibly easy for these doctors it's the most stressful time for doctors in possibly some of their whole careers it'd have been incredibly easy for them to leave us behind or send us home early or just leave us waiting in a room uh, to see a patient but the way they've managed to incorporate us into the team has been excellent in feeling like we're giving back to the NHS and also it's been really important for our development into the junior doctors who are going to be starting work in a couple of months. They've been very supportive. Yeah and tell us Patrick about the sorts of things you've been doing then on your placements. I think the difference between my placements this year and pre-Covid, um, I think it's been as Chantal said, um, the independence we've been given um, and the fact that the junior doctors are seeing us less as their inferiors in a way or, or just medical students and we are more useful useful people to have around. If they're managing 10 more patients than they've been used to, then we are really helpful to um, take bloods or clerk patients in. So I think we have been able to be utilised a lot better than in the past and hopefully that continues because it has been great for us to become more confident on the wards. And I know, Chantelle, uh, you've been on wards where you've been dealing with lots of end of life care and, and that's been difficult for you. Can you tell us about some of that, please? Yes, yeah, so I think 
we obviously get taught about end of life care. We've had placements in around surrounding end of life care, and um, I've seen it through family members myself. And I think I thought I was really accustomed to it. I thought I was used to it. I thought I was quite comfortable almost around death, but it was still it was still intense. It was still um, difficult. And I think the the hardest part is families not being there until you know really quite the last moment in that or sometimes missing that moment and that's that's challenging and I think seeing the staff just have it as such a regular part of their day um is it's heartbreaking watching your colleagues struggle um through that but actually I think the what that's shown is is the resilience of the team um I found I've seen teams ask every single morning and how are we all doing today how are we feeling um does anyone need anything um the amount of people that you know let's have a sit down and have a cup of tea um and there's not always been time for it but people certainly try um there was one incident i attended where we didn't have time for a debrief after a, a patient passed and it, it was really intense and that's that's not the norm that's not what i've been used to um, we used to have the time in the facilities, the rooms to sit down and chat about what happened. Um, and it, it's been a bit difficult, but the I got a text from the doctor I was with um, a couple of days later, like, how are you doing? How are you feeling? Everything OK? And I got a look. He sent me a number for some counselling through the NHS if I wanted to talk about some of the things I'd seen. Um, so I think it, it's, it has been challenging. It has been hard. Um, it's nice to still see the compassion there, the you know, the care for our colleagues, the teamwork. Um, and actually, I thought that would be something that slipped through the cracks because we're just so busy and people are so tired and fed up. And actually, it hasn't. And that, it, it just shows how amazing our colleagues are in the NHS. I've just been amazed by them. Absolutely. And, and, and Patrick, can you tell us about the sort of support that's been there for, for both you and Chantelle and your fellow students at this time? Because it's, it's just unprecedented, isn't it? It's not something that you would ever imagine you would have to be dealing with so soon. I mean, I think especially as a lot of us weren't able to, as we were on hot wards, we weren't able to go home and see our parents for most of the summer. That was a situation I was personally in. I know a lot of people who've had extra support from the university or their GP um, and the medical school to help them through this tough time. But I can speak personally as someone who's reached out for additional help over the last 12 months. And I'm sure the university counselling services have, ha have been inundated with students going through similar things to what I was going through. Um, but they were very approachable. They managed to adapt to them, the online format very well. And I felt like I was being supported a lot more than I imagined I would have been able to be in at the time. And I guess otherwise I've been able to rely on, I'm lucky enough to live with other medical students going through the same thing. Mm -hmm. um, so it's been nice to have their backs and if you come home from a bad day on placement, um, just people to talk to. And I think we have become a lot better at talking about bad days um, because there have been more bad days. That is, that is just the truth. We've come home after much longer shifts, after seeing things that we weren't quite prepared for or, or thought we weren't going to see for a few years especially end of life situations um but it has encouraged us to speak more openly about how we're feeling how our mental health is and hopefully when we do become doctors that can continue because it's very easy for people to stay quiet when they're struggling but if you've got people to share it with it does make it a lot easier absolutely and Chantelle I know you reached out to, to the student counselling service is that right yeah I did I, I saw um quite a traumatic day um and I came home and I felt angry and it's not a feeling I'm familiar with I think I'm normally quite a bright bubbly person and I thought I'm not myself at the moment and it was all perspective I was letting things overwhelm me and I was get I was just thinking about the negatives and everything and I thought I just need someone to talk about how to refocus um, my energy and refocus those thoughts onto what are we doing that's good? How can we improve things? How can we stay positive and healthy and just look after ourselves in all of this? I wasn't making time to to have the occasional bubble bath in an evening if I had an evening free or treat myself to some chocolate. It sounds really silly, but I wasn't doing those things. And I had a wonderful lady talk me through keeping myself strong, keeping myself happy actually makes me so much better um, as a student and as a as a colleague and as a friend to all the other people struggling. So 
I honestly, I don't know how I'd have, I'd have got through and with through it without her. She was absolutely wonderful. Um, she made me cry <laughs> multiple times. Happy to. She was fantastic. Um, and I think it's, it's wonderful to have a university where that service is accessible and it's quick. Um, I sort of reached out and within two, three weeks, I had a system set up. I spoke to this lady every fortnight. Um, she was really um, flexible with me having placement and, and some strange hours. Um, and I just, I think that's, it's essential, but not everyone has access to that. And I feel really lucky to have had it um, during this sort of time. Because it was more needed than ever. I can imagine, absolutely. And I'm so glad that you both have had access to those things. Patrick, just, uh, I know that some of your, your colleagues and friends are kind of just graduated when the pandemic hit and and we're part of the the NHS student workforce that, that graduated early if you know what I mean in order to to get straight on the front line how was it for you as a year behind looking on at that it was quite a strange experience I had one housemate who's now a doctor um housemate Edmund who we there's an option at Leeds to intercalate to do an extra degree for a year and that prolongs the course by a year so six years instead of five and he chose to go straight through to final year and had I not chosen to do that extra year, I would have been on the front line with him and I would have graduated and become right. a doctor last year. Um, so it was it was weird because it felt like, I almost felt guilty at the start because I was thinking that should be me. I should be out there helping. But obviously hindsight's a wonderful thing. And um, I got a lot out of, my, out of that year. Um, but I think seeing him come home from some really long challenging shifts and I, I feel like that year group were very much thrown into the deep end no, there was no option but to throw them into the deep end because we needed junior doctors um, and seeing him come home and the struggles he was facing I think that did make myself and my housemates feel like this is getting a bit real we do need to grow up and face the truth that we're going to eventually be in that similar position um, yeah, it was I, nice did to support him. <laughs> I did the same thing with my housemate and I was like goodness I need to study harder <laughs> I thought that's why I felt as well I got straight on the books when he came home absolutely and and I think it's been a hugely challenging time for you all and I suppose now I suppose you're now not far off graduating yourselves now are you so how do you kind of feel about the situation that we're in now and that you'll you'll be qualified very soon and, and going into that it's a little bit scary, but it's also really exciting. I think when I when I said earlier at the start, graduating and qualifying felt sort of within arm's reach and you sort of wanted to join in. Um, I was actually worried I wouldn't be ready. Um, so I said I studied harder, I thought about it. And actually, I'm surprised that I feel a lot more ready than I did think I would feel um, at this point. So I think having that, um, I mean, I suppose as a fifth year, you've learned a lot of the content it's about putting it into practice and that's what our placements have allowed us to do this year um been a bit of a whistle stop tour we've already sat our exams um, and then they're several months early um but actually having that earlier and having passed them you think well I can do it so I am almost ready and you know we, we, I'm sort of really excited to despite it being a little bit nerve-wracking really excited to get stuck in and um, my family is so excited. Um, they can't wait to hear all about my days. <laughs> I bet they're so proud of you. I have to hope so. <laughs> <laughs> and has it changed, Chantelle, your, your direction, I suppose, of what you wanted to, you know, your specialism or changed anything that you wanted to do when you, when you graduate and go into? I'd always um, really considered emergency medicine quite high up there. Um, sort of being with people in an emergency sort of when they need you the most that that was a really scary time for people and I've always been drawn to the the energy and the teamwork in that um field um but having seen it during the pandemic um I was actually on my A&E rotation my A&E week when um the, the people started coming in with coronavirus um I actually ended up isolating myself at the end of the week <laughs> and um it also became very real but that reinforced my, it didn't change it, it reinforced it. I thought oh, I'd love to be a part of this team. Uh, they've been, they've just been amazing. And I was just in awe of them all the time. I probably looked like a massive fan girl, just constantly just watching them all in and smiling at them. But I, I just think that they're fantastic. And to be able to make those decisions quickly and confidently and save a life, like 
it, it just it just blows my mind and I'd love to be able to be that good at it <laughs> and, and and to help people like that so it's I'm reinforced sure it yeah definitely. <laughs> I'm sure you will be Chantelle and Patrick has it changed anything for you learning in this environment? I think as Chantelle said it had it has made me realize that I probably do more I do know more than I thought I knew and I think this last year as we've had this in mind that we do actually need to be very competent being, being on the ward you do need to know your stuff to be able to save lives um, so I, I think it has made us made me into a more competent junior doctor in, in a couple of months and in terms of my own career direction, I think maybe ask me again in, in three or four years time, I've, I'm no close to deciding. <laughs> it's been a good year going around a lot of different specialties, but I haven't found the one yet. Still to find that one that, that really catches your attention. I'm sure I will. There's been some things I've loved doing, but I can't make any concrete plans yet. <laughs> far too young, far too young for that. And I suppose, although this has been a, a hugely challenging and at times frightening time for you all, what positives would you say have, has come out of this situation? During this sort of period of time, I've actually seen some of the most incredible medicine um, in my entire five years. And I've seen some, some compassion. I didn't think people really would make the time for. Um, I saw an elderly medicine consultant um, feed a gentleman his breakfast because there was no one else to help him and he was really poorly. Um, he was probably heading towards end of life and with his family not being able to visit and other people not having the time, she made that time. She made that special moment. She had this bond with the patient and it was just lovely. It was just, I thought that's the doctor, the doctor that makes the time to do those important things. Um, I have cared for people in my in my part time jobs and in in, in family, um, but I think it's not something people sort of see consultants do in hospitals all that often. Um, and, and like I say, just the teamwork and the spirit of it. Um, some one of my colleagues said to me the other day, um, I actually feel really sorry for people that don't work in healthcare because we've still had a social life and they haven't because work's become a bit of a laugh. We've got used to all the the this ridiculous outfit we've got to wear half the time and it's all been fun um when we when we can make it fun and that's been really nice to see we've seen a lot more smiles than i thought we would and um everyone's pulled each other through and you patrick yeah adding on to that i think the res resilience of the teams and the camaraderie on the wards has been incredible after the short break we had while the university thought about how to deal with the situation how we'd return onto the wards um, I expected it to be quite morose and quite serious, um, but the way that the junior doctors and um, the consultants managed to make it such a good team to be part of, and so in the best way they could, be optimistic and lighthearted and just, we're all in this together, let's get through this, let's save some lives, was just incredible to see and made me really excited, actually, to be able to join the team properly. You both must be really proud. I mean, I hope you're proud of yourselves because I'm proud listening to you. It's fantastic. How do you feel going into this next step in, into your careers? I think it's been it's been strange coming to terms with it. It's, it's a long course, six years, and I've been very used to telling people oh, I've got lots of years left. I've still got two years left. Um, most people are there for three. We get double that. I feel like I've been very lucky to be here so long. Um, I think this year has made me realise that you can't stay a student forever and that what I really would quite like to be is a junior doctor working in the NHS. I can't think of any job that, that I'd enjoy more and that I could give back as much as being a junior doctor. So I think I'm, as much as it pains me to say, I think I'm finally ready to stop being a student. I sort of add on to that a very similar um, sort of message. I feel it's been an absolute privilege to be able to be a part of this year. Um, it's been a privilege to be patients when other people can't be with them, to hold their hands and to talk to them and to be part of the team that does that. And it's made me appreciate that we get such a special moment with these um, in, in people's lives. Um, and we have the opportunity to make it a, a really positive experience when we can. Um, and I've really enjoyed doing that. And when I had my vaccine, I obviously I feel amazing. We've had been able to have a vaccine as a medical student, and that's something not everyone has access to. So I feel very lucky about that. Um, the doctor that consented me for my vaccine said, 
oh, this is the most wonderful career you could ever have. He said, don't take it for granted. You're going to absolutely love it. And it's, it, it is that, it's been such a motivating and sort of, it's, it's been the push we needed. It's been that kick up um, behind us to get us moving in the right direction. And I feel more ready than I thought I would, um, ready to get stuck in. <laughs> Fantastic. I mean, sorry, Patrick. The, the lead GP I had for my GP rotation on placement this year um, was called up out of retirement um, to help out with the pressures. And he had been, he was 68, 69 years old. He'd been out of work for five or six years and he came back just to teach us and sit in with us to make sure that we'd be safe doing phone consultations. And I could really tell, and he did tell us at the end that he, he really missed being, being mm. a part of the team and being a, a, a doctor still. I think it's that camaraderie of it, isn't it? Absolutely. Particularly at the moment, it's heightened, isn't it? Well, thank you both so much. I mean, I know you're both on night shift tonight, aren't you? So, so thank you so much for, for uh, giving us some of your, your rest time before you do start your shift. And, and like I say, I'm sure I, I speak for everyone when I say, say how proud we are of, of all of you. So thank you so much for joining us tonight, Chantelle and Patrick. Thank you. Well, at this point, I'd like to welcome back Professor Paul Stewart. Hi, Paul. Hello, Marie. I mean, those students say it all, don't they? Absolutely fantastic what they, they, they've been through and what they're doing and, and, and the way that the university and the faculty has responded to COVID. You must be really proud. Yeah, I mean, I, I, I always get very emotional when I when I hear stories like that and of course it 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 reinforces to me just how privileged I am to have you know the best job in the world I mean <laughs> you know inspiring students and um, you know whatever the understandable reservations that Patrick and Chantelle are having you know I know through bitter experience that they're going to be outstanding doctors and um, and, and that that's really important I, I think also the staff I think you know, we've seen an immense, um, I think, coming together that I never, that I never would. And I've just written to the staff today. And, and I think it's the way that, that we are now. You know, we're all seeing each other's interior decor. We're seeing kitchens. We're seeing bedrooms. We're seeing pets. Uh, and latterly, I've enjoyed seeing and meeting, you know, children, school kids being taught at home. You know, it really has brought us, I think, to, together um, and, and I don't think we'll lose that going forward so it's it, it, it's not only hearing those inspiring student stories you know success in the face of adversity but also for me um, you, you know how we've come together I think closer as a, a as a staff group to, to, to move forward yeah mm -hmm. And I know some of our, our guests tonight might have heard or, or have even supported the NHS Student work Workforce Fund Paul, can you tell us a bit more about that, please? Yeah, so this was something we launched in the spring of 2020. And, um, you know, we've always, as you know, we've always put as our number one priority student, student support. But we were well aware very early on with the, you know, the kind of um, um, really huge change that was going on in their education delivery and the disruption that was causing. And what this has been really is, is been catalytic in terms of the tangible support. There's, there's money behind this. We're, we're very grateful for everybody that's donated uh, that we've been able to, to offer students. So much of that, as you've heard today on the call, you know, the disruptive education, largely in terms of clinical placements, critical to ensure, you know, for all of us on this call that we could graduate uh, the future healthcare workforce early. But social distancing meant students had to travel further to a greater number of providers. Um, many of our students, the whole economics of, of funding university, you know, and, and university life at the moment mean that many have got additional jobs. Some are doing uh, paid carer responsibilities as part of their, their courses, overnight shifts. Um, and all, as, as Chantelle very movingly reminded us, have seen more, you know, very severely ill and dying patients than would be expected at that stage of their training. Um, so I'm pleased to announce that we've made almost 100 awards. The mean, you know, the, the kind of average support package is somewhere in the region of, of £600. And we now wish to raise 
uh, a further sum of money, somewhere between 75 and, and, a, and 100,000 pounds, which really will be targeted uh, to more directive counselling support. And you heard very nicely from Patrick how, you know, I think he, he obviously in his own mind benefited from that. And that support is going to come particularly with specialists that, that you know, are, are trained in handling trauma and, and kind of, you know, crisis, crisis management. I want to go on record as saying I don't want a single student to drop out from the course because of any difficulties they faced in, in 2020 or now going into 2021. And I'm even more resolved to ensure that all of our students complete their degrees. Uh, you know, we must remember this has been the most difficult time for the NHS, certainly in my 40, 40 years as a, you know, a career in medicine. So a big thanks again to those of you who have already contributed. Particular thanks on the call here today. I know there's representatives from the Wilson Foundation, Heart Research UK and the Victoria Foundation who, who've made generous support to us as well. So a really big thank you to all of you. It's been, it's made a huge difference. It has, it's made a tremendous difference. And, and again, you know, thank you to everybody who has supported that fund. Finally, Paul, how does the future of medical education look um, from your perspective? Will you continue to use virtual platforms? Will yeah. this situation ch have changed a lot for you or, or will things go back to how they were? In, they certainly won't go back to as, as they were. I, I think it's worthwhile reminding us that even before COVID hit, we were really at the forefront probably internationally in terms of the future of medical education. You know, that's one reason why um, our medical school is, is ranked number one and has been so for the last three to five years, at least in terms of student feedback. You know, we've been pioneering that technology enhanced learning for, for a while. Uh, and I think is all this has done really is to sharpen the lens and the focus on, on, on driving through that agenda more, more quickly. So, you know, it's no secret to anyone on this call that you know the future of healthcare is increasingly going to be in 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 data in digital computational skills artificial intelligence algorithms that will drive care empowerment of patients with a move to you know integrated care systems and technology will be the 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 the, the, the glue there i i mean i give you one example i didn't give earlier but i noticed um in the chat bar um it, it, uh, Ivan Simmons, one of one of our dental alumni, dentistry has been hugely challenging with what we've had to go through with the aerosol generating restrictions that have been in place through high speed drilling, mm -hmm. and we've been able to accommodate working with our own engineers and get around that and use now so called low speed rotors, um, which don't have the same aerosol generating capacity. Um, and that's one example where we probably won't be going back, you know, and using that together with our 3D printers for simulating dental caries. You know, we've completely changed the face of, of dental education uh, in, in, in moving forward. I, I do just want to highlight finally, then, Marie, that the, the few, you know, it's, it, this has been hugely inspiring for me to witness all this, but the future is going to be very challenging, you know, just as every industry up and down the land uh, is going to have to, you know, fund its way out of what we've seen, then, then our university is no exception. Um, and as we, you know, the stark reality of all, all the things you've heard today, particularly our medical research, is to be honest, it's heavily subsidised by international students uh, in other parts of the university. Now that for me doesn't pass the Daily Mail test, it's not something I'm proud of, but I'm afraid it is the macroeconomics of how universities you know, working at the moment. And, and obviously with the drop in those international students, um, we're gonna be facing some challenging times, but we've got the resilience, we've got a great leadership team, and first and foremost, we've got inspiring students. So I know we'll get there. Thank you, Paul, we, we absolutely do. And, and thank you so much for, for your time uh, this evening. It's been really fantastic to hear about the faculty's work in more depth. And I'm sure I speak for, for everyone here tonight when we say how proud we are of the, the, the university faculty's response to COVID. And we wish you all, um, the staff, the students, all of you, all the researchers, the very best of luck for the future. Well, thank you. And, and as everyone on this call knows, you know, we hugely appreciate our, our alumni and um, my door's always open if, uh, if anyone on this call wants to contact me about anything. Thank you. Thank you, Paul.
Now, I'd also like to thank Dr. Uh, Minaj Savan, our students, of course, Chantelle Waddington and Patrick Ashby, and all of the students, staff, alumni and supporters who have contributed to the university's COVID response over the last year. And of course, thank you to you, our audience this evening for joining us. We hope you found tonight's event really informative. If you'd like to find out more about how you can support our students or the university research, please get in touch with us at alumni at leeds.ac.uk. Now to help us continue to build and shape our events for the future, when you leave this webinar, you'll be linked to a short survey, which I'd be really grateful if you could fill out for me. Good night, everyone, and enjoy the rest of your evening.